In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey. You know, when we think of modern day revivals, one revival has to be included. It started Father's Day, 1995. Of course, I'm talking about Brownsville Assembly in Pensacola, Florida. Today, you're going to hear from a man whose decision to be the one impacted millions. Of course, I'm talking about Pastor John Kilpatrick, who joined me right here in the studio. You're gonna enjoy this because you're gonna hear an insider view and learn how the miracles of Brownsville started long before the revival ever happened. So come along and listen to Pastor John Kilpatrick. Something deep inside of me was calling out to the deep of God. And I said, Lord, there's gotta be more. And I would come in here in this building and I would scare myself, friend. It was the stillness of that dark pre-dawn hours. Four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and I'd lay on that front row and I'd grab my belly and bellow out like a cow. Oh, God! I need you, Lord! I would walk these floors and I would cry out loud. I knew nobody was around and I knew nobody could hear. And I'd lift my voice sometime till I would be hoarse and I'd say, God, there's more. There's got to be more. I thank you, Lord, for the church. I thank you for the building. I thank you for my wife and children. But, oh, God, I'm dying inside. And I would say to God, if you don't come, if you don't come in this place, I can't take it. Pastor John, I am so excited you're here. I've been waiting for you to get here. Well, thank you. Yeah, we have, I have so many things to talk to you about. We may not let you go. Well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> I'm here for the duration. We want to talk about revival, obviously, in Pensacola and all that happened there. But I want to start earlier than that. And I want to know about you. Tell me some of your history and your earliest memories of revival and what that was like. Um, you mean when I was young? Yes. Young? Uh, I had a pastor. Uh, his son married my half-sister, my oldest half-sister. He was a powerful man of God. He later became my mentor and uh, my spiritual father. But he, he was a man that had a walk with God that I wish to this day that I had. He was German, Wetzel. And um, he was humble, extremely humble, but he was brilliant. He had a brilliant mind, mm. but he had a walk with God that he knew God, that man knew God. And because I was with him a lot, he helped introduce me to a walk with God, not just the Lord, but a walk with God. Oh, so good. that goes all the way back to the time I was six years old, five years old, really. Wow. Yeah. You were telling me a story before we went on the air about um, when you were 12 years old. Tell us that story again about that. Well, my father left us when I was 12, and um, they separated when I was eight, but they got back together. So from eight until 12, my life was really tumultuous. My father was abusive to my mother because she got saved under my brother-in-law's tent revival. Uh -huh. And uh, he didn't want a Christian wife. He certainly didn't want a tongue-talking Christian wife. But my mother was real solid. She was not a, uh, you know, she was not a fanatical type person whatsoever. Excellent wife, uh, very pretty lady. Took very good care of him. And um, so whenever she began taking me to church, uh, my father, I think it was just Satan in him. He just did not want her taking me to a Pentecostal church, church in general, but especially Pentecostal church. So whenever he left, I was 12, and my mother had a nervous breakdown. 
And so whenever she had the nervous breakdown, I was watching Oral Roberts one morning. And whenever I was watching the program, he said in the course of the program, I'm going to be coming to Columbus, Georgia, bringing my tent. Well, my father, even though he was like he was, he still had an effect on me because he was my father. And the things that he said about preachers, the things he said about tongues, speaking in tongues and Pentecostals, it couldn't help but affect me <clears throat> because I heard it all the time. Right. And he was my father. Well, when, when he made that statement, the kids at school started really mocking him and saying that, you know, he was a fake, he was a fraud, he had something in his hand, and when he touched people, it zapped them, you know. And... Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ, heal. Woman, you have faith. Put your hand up there and feel how, how loose your flesh is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So I was really in consternation. I didn't know what to believe. I wanted to believe. I loved my mother. I trusted my mother. But my father's words had an impact on me. I didn't know what to believe. So I remember I went into her bedroom and I said, Mama, I just heard old Robert say that he's coming to the, camp, uh, to the fairgrounds. And she, I said, can I go? Oh, no, 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 no. I can't let my baby go, no. I wasn't but 12. So finally, I stayed with it, and I finally prevailed, and she agreed to let me go. Well, I rode the city bus down to the fairgrounds. I had to get out and walk. So I got there a little bit early, and I, I was looking for a good seat, a good vantage point, because I'd heard about all these healings, and I wanted to see. I needed to see something. Mm. I needed to see it. And so um, he preached. He had on a white suit. He had on a bow tie like Colonel Sanders, you know, and... He preached. He was a really handsome guy in, in person. He was more handsome in person than he was on, on camera. Indian-looking guy, dark skin. He preached, and I, I didn't pay that much attention to the sermon. I was just 12. But now when it came time for him to pray for the sick, he took his tie off, took his coat off, rolled his sleeves up, and he had these people parade up this ramp in front of him. But when they started coming up that ramp, I saw him pray for several people and nothing eventful, nothing to the naked eye, you know. I, I was a little bit disappointed. But then I saw in the shadows a black woman and um, she had a gorder hanging off her neck about that long, it's hanging on top of her breast. Mm. And she had veins in that gorder as big as my finger. Wow. And when she walked, it just wobbled like that. So I said, mm-hmm. So I got over at a good vantage point. And when she came in front of him, he said, put his hands on his hips like this. He said, Mama, you believe God can heal you? And she put her hands on her hips. She said, Oh, Roberts, do you really believe I'd be in this line if I didn't believe God could heal me? <laughs> and he, pow, just that quick. Oh. He didn't even lay hands on her. He just popped her with two fingers. And as soon as he popped her, he took the microphone in his hand and stuck it right to her neck. He knew what was going to happen. And I tell you the honest truth, it sounded like she was swallowing a milkshake. You could hear her swallowing, just swallowing and swallowing and swallowing. And I'd say, I'm guessing three, four minutes, her neck was as normal as mine. Mm. I left that meeting right after that happened. I didn't stay for the rest of it. Caught the city bus home. Never had another doubt mm. about the reality of what I believed and what my wow. mother raised me to believe. Never had another doubt. One miracle changed your life. One miracle changed my life. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what happened then? I mean, you're 12 years old now. Now you've, you've seen God really move. I went to church for two years at my brother-in-law's dad's church, which later became, as I said, my mentor, my spiritual father. And I went there for two years. I, I wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit, couldn't receive it. So... Um, I was sitting there in classroom, and they were showing a film in biology on first, in first period on dissection. They were cutting something up on the screen. I just got it off my mind. I started praying under my breath, Lord, I want the Holy Spirit so bad. While I was praying, the projector was seated alphabetically. I was K. I was right in the middle of the classroom, and the, and the projector was right by my head. And while I was praying, it was just like somebody took the knob like that and cut the volume down. And when it did, I jumped. And I don't know why I jumped, but I jumped. Yeah, wow. You know, felt like I was, you know, like, what's going on here? 
And then as soon as I calmed down, I heard a tender voice in my left ear, like a father, say, John, this day I have called you to preach my word, and I'll be with you, but you must keep yourself from the other young people in the neighborhood that will have a bad influence on you, because if you don't, I'll lose you. And then the Lord called me to do five things in the ministry. And as soon as he stated the fifth thing that he was calling me to do, he said, this day I'll confirm this call in your ear. Well, as soon as the, uh, as soon as the voice stopped speaking, I heard the projector come right back up. Well, I was dumbfounded because I'm 14. Right, right. And the thing that so shocked me is I couldn't believe he knew where my school was. <laughs> you know, I, I knew he knew where my church was, but yeah. my, he found me at school. He knew how to find you. Yeah. And so I didn't feel any different until I got up to walk. And when I stood up to walk, I could not feel my legs at all. I mean, nothing. I yeah. could, it was like I had air. It was like I was just moving like that. I was going to my second period class. It was math class. And it was like I was floating up that incline to my math class. Well, when I got to math class, um, I sat there, and the, my math teacher was out that day, and they had a fill-in substitute teacher, and he was a retired Baptist preacher. His name was Richard Chaplin. Mm. And before class started, he looked at me back there in the back. He looked over his class, and you know, he has glasses down on the end of his nose, and he's looking over the class. And he looked at me and said, come here, I said, so he walked back there to where I was. He says, son, what's going on with you, man? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I see the glory of God all over you. Wow. I said, really? And I started crying. Yeah. And so I told him what happened last period, and he started crying. Well, I thought that was confirmation. So I went the rest of the day, and about third or fourth period, I began to get my feeling back in my legs. So my mother had to work at a nursing home when my dad left, so she had to be at work at 4. So bell rang at 3.25, so if I'd run home, she'd have me a sandwich fixing some tea, and she'd pray with me before she went to work. So I ran up the steps to the house, and I pulled the screen door open, and I said, Mama, come here. And so she came out of the back of the house real slow. And I said, Mama, sit down. I got something to tell you. She said, No, son. I said, you sit down. I got something to tell you. I said, Mama, this is important. I can't waste time. You got to go to work. She said, just listen. She said, today a woman came by here selling donuts for the church of God. And said, I've never seen this woman in my life. And my mother had me when she was 42. Hmm. And so um, she said, uh, asked me if I wanted to buy some donuts. So I went to the back of the house and got a dollar out of my purse, paid her through the screen door. And... Uh, she said, when I paid her, she turned to walk off the front porch. And when she did, she stopped in her tracks and laid the donut she had left under her arm on the banister. Raised her hands on our front porch. Didn't even know my mother. Wow. Didn't even know my mother's a Christian. They didn't exchange pleasantries or anything. And the interpret she gave out a message in tongues, and the interpretation said, this day I've called your son to preach my word. You must keep him from the other boys and girls in the neighborhood that will have a bad influence on him if you don't want to lose him. And then when she got through telling me that, she said, now, what was you going to tell me? <laughs> and so I never in my life have ever for one second doubted wow. my call to the ministry. Wow, praise God. What yeah. a story. If I have any success, Gene, I have to be honest with you and tell you, probably has very little to do with me, has everything to do with my mother. Hmm. Praying yeah. mama. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so let's let's keep going. Um, so that's at fourteen, con confirmed in one day. You yeah. you've seen him you've seen him move at twelve, never doubted it. At fourteen, you're called in the ministry. Where it sounds like there was no doubt at that point either. No this is what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. What happened next? Well, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it made a change in my life because now. I wasn't just operating out of my soulish senses. Yeah. Now, you know, I was beginning to learn how to walk in the Spirit. And I right. began to develop a relationship with the Lord. But the pastor <clears throat> came to my mother and he said, Errol May, he said, I know God's called your son to preach. And he said, would you let me take him since you're working at night and there's nobody else in the house? Would you let me take him and pray with, and teach him how to pray? And I'm standing there and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, 
I'm called to preach. I'm not called to pray. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I didn't know what he knew. And he knew that if I was ever going to be successful in the ministry, I had to learn to be, first of all, successful in prayer. So he would start at 1130 at night. We always prayed with the lights out. He would lay in the floor, put his hand under his head like this, take his towel off, roll his sleeves up, and lay in the floor and tell preacher stories. And when I'd sit there and lay on the floor beside him over there, you know, across from him, and he'd tell them preacher stories, my heart would flare up and burn, man. Uh. I mean, just burn. It's like, God, what is this? And I heard him tell them, and I was, I was with him for years. I heard him tell story after story. He repeated some of them through the years. He'd tell about people getting saved in the brush arbors. He'd tell about people where he'd have to get off the train at night, walk the railroad tracks. He'd have to count the slats on the railroad tracks so many miles down the railroad tracks. Then he'd take a left. He'd walk in the dark to a brush arbor. They had lanterns out there, and they'd preach, and people would get saved, and he'd have to walk the railroad track back, catch, catch the train back into St. Louis. Hmm. He'd tell all those kinds of stories. You know, my heart would just burn. He'd tell about people being healed, great healings during the Depression era. And things like that. And, and I used to lay there and think, God, you reckon I'll ever have any stories like this? And see, looking back on it now, I didn't realize it then as a boy. But what was going on in my life then was a precursor and a preview of what my life was going to be. But sure. I was hearing my life being spelled out through his mouth. Right. And I was under his mantle. It's really important whose mantle you get under. Because what's on, what's on their mantle is going to get on you. Mm. I can promise you. Yeah. Boy, yeah. that's, that's, that's so true. Let's go back to the prayer. If you had to, you were, you were saying that how you were really not that interested when you started. Mm -hmm. But you, obviously things grew. What was it you can say that you learned from him during those times? Uh, one of the things I learned was um, he, 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 before we would pray, he'd always tell us not to doze, not to sleep. And I had to be at school the next morning yeah. at 7.30. So, you know, I wouldn't get home till like 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. I got used to no sleep real early in my life. But he would teach us not to doze, not to be chatting in the corners with other people when it's time to pray. Get the gum out of your mouth. And he'd begin to pre uh, teach, teach us on different kinds of prayer, intercessory prayer, you know, petition prayer, all kinds of things like that. And so whenever I began to pray, he would tell us, now don't pray to be heard. You don't want to get in here and start walking around like you're preaching and try to impress everybody about how good you can pray. Don't do that. You're praying to the Lord. You're not praying to, for us to hear you. Yeah. And... Uh, as we began to pray every night like that, I could feel my relationship with the Lord thickening, yeah. thickening, no doubt about it. And then I began to see answers to prayer. Some prayers were about three weeks out. Some answers to prayer were like several months out, that kind right. of thing. But um, that's some of the things that I noticed as we began to pray. He would teach us to prevail and not give up. He'd say, the victory, you've got to pray until you get the victory, pray through. In the Bible days, when, when, war, when there would be wars, Israel would fight wars, the war would not be over until they went in and took the spoils. Oh. Israel would take the spoils. Yeah. And the Lord said, you're not through praying until you take the spoils. Oh, take it away good. from the devil. That's good. Mm -hmm. Seems to me, I remember a story <clears throat> Where you had a real visitation from heaven one night in that prayer time. What was that? Well, pastor, we had revival break out at the church. And it was an awesome revival. I still remember the evangelist's name to this day. He was handsome, really handsome. Wasn't married, but he came in and, and the revival was really going full steam ahead. You know, just a lot of things happening. But pastor was checked. And... Um, he called him in one day and he told him, he said, son, I'm going to shut down the revival because I know something's not right. I can't put my finger on it, but something's not right. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, he ended the revival. 
Well, that guy took a lot of the people with him from the church and split the church. Uh I saw revival up close and personal when I was young. I saw the drawbacks of it. I saw the fraud of revival. I saw personality worship. I saw it up front, saw it personal, wanted no part of it. But it didn't turn me off to revival. Uh So the church went down. Pastor got us together one Sunday night after church. We went to a cafe, and there was several of us boys there that always prayed with him. He told us that he was leaving. He was moving to Winter Haven, Florida. He was taking a church down there. But when he told us that, you know, he'd become my father. Yeah, sure. You know, and he was leaving now. And how old were you about this time? I was I was 15. Okay. 15 now. I've been praying with him about a year. Right. So, you know, when he told us he was leaving, well, it conjured up all that stuff about my father leaving. Yeah. You know, and now he's leaving. And it just, it stuck a knife deep. Yeah. So I, I wanted to cry, but I didn't want him to see me cry. So we went back to the church after he told us that. And um, we walked to the church, lights out like we always did, you know. And I, I went out and sat in the audience. I didn't come up and lay in the floor there where the rest of them was. He'd tell the stories. I just sat in the audience. And I was so in pain, I just said, man, if I could just catch a city bus, I'd go home. I'd never come back. Mm. So um, there was city buses that ran in our city, but they never they didn't run on Sunday nights. That was the only nights they didn't run. This was on Sunday night. So I felt trapped. Then I said, well, I'll walk home. Well, it was too dangerous because it was during the time of the civil rights marches, you know, in sure. Georgia. There was looting and burning. Too dangerous. I felt trapped. Yeah. So... They all started praying after a while, and I just sat there, and I mean, I was crying. He couldn't see me. I was crying, and I was swearing to myself, I'll never be back. I'll never come back. I'm not going to go through this again. So, um, man, they started praying. They didn't pray 10 or 15 minutes. I got up one time and tried to pray, and the atmosphere was so heavy in that church because of all the church had been through. The atmosphere was, you know, loaded with all that conflict. Well, I just went back and flopped down in my seat, you know, and... So finally, I heard a guy that prayed with us all the time. He said, well, boys, I think I'm going to put on my shoes and go to the house. So he came back up and he sat on the altar in front of the church. And he reached down to put his shoes on, but he never put them on. He just sat right back up. And then there were 17 of us in the meeting that night. So then people began to sort of come from all over the sanctuary and just sort of sit on them altar benches. Well, then pastor came and he never got through praying that quick. And he sat on the altar bench. Well, I'm sitting out there by myself, and I feel a little bit strange. So I got up and came and sat by pastor on the altar. While we were sitting there on that altar, it was like just a, just like a holy hush came in that place. Mm. And uh, the doors in the back of the church went up like this. There were two of them, big ones, big doors. There were 10 metal doors, and they had... They were locked through the pins in the jam at the top, pins in the jam at the bottom, key beneath the doorknob, a dead bolt, and a latch. They were locked five ways. Uh-huh. Some kind of a force hit those doors. They opened on their own accord, never busted a lock, never busted anything. They just opened up on their own with just enough force that those metal doorknobs tapped those plaster walls. And in off the stage walked one angel. And when he walked in, he came in through the foyer there and he turned like a soldier. He turned just like a soldier and he went and stood where Brother Wetzel always prayed. He stood just like a soldier, just like this. Right in behind him came another one. And he turned and he stood over by the right-hand side of the building. Well, I'm sitting there and I'm 15 years old now. Yeah. And I've been praying for a year. And pastor always told me, he says, son, God's going to reward you and you'll see the rewards of your prayers. Well, when I saw those angels, I really thought I was dreaming. Honestly, I mean, I was sitting there and I, I moved my hand up to my face and touched my face like that. And I said, I'm dreaming. This is not real. But when I touched my face, I said, no, this is real. Yeah. 
And when I saw that angel over here and I saw that angel over there, I just looked back and forth between both of them. Never seen anything that big in my life. They filled it from the floor to the ceiling. Mm. And after what seemed like a few minutes, and it was much longer, I, I know it had to be, the one that came in first turned like a soldier, walked to the center aisle, turned. The other one came, came to the center aisle, and they walked out and left those doors open. Pastor said that the Lord spoke to him that night. And he said, Raymond, I don't want you to leave this church. I want you to stay here and I want you to pour into these boys. He said, because I'll use these boys to touch far more than you'll ever touch in your life. So I want you to sacrifice and not go, but I want you to stay here and pour into these boys. Wow. So he stayed and uh, I stayed with him. I even dated my wife during that whole time. And I'd take her home from the date and come and be at the church by 11.30 at night and meet him and pray until one or two o'clock in the morning. Mm. That's the way we dated. Yeah. And um, that marked my life because to this day, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how bad things are, I can still see those angels walk inside that church with them doors popping open just enough for them doorknobs to tap those plaster walls. I can still hear them doorknobs tap those walls and I can see those angels walk in. And I can still see my eyes going back and forth from one to the other one and saying, no, I'm not dreaming, this is real. And then when they walked out, that was the first time when we walked in that foyer back there and we went down, my first encounter with the power of God. Wow. I, I mean, went down and out. Sure. Wow. And that was my first encounter. So. No matter how bad things get, I can always remember those angels never said a word. They had no wings. They looked like they had on warrior type clothes, but no weapons. Never said a word, never lifted a finger, but their presence broke the hell off that house. Yeah. And immediately, the following Wednesday night, the church had filled up because the word got out about those angels. And it filled up. And um, I saw what when God intervenes and deals in a situation like that where the atmosphere is so contaminated and defiled right, with trouble, right, right. they just broke it just like that. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how from Pastor John's troubled beginnings, God carefully laid in layer after layer of faith, discipline, and mentoring. Did you notice how John was trained to be disciplined and how to pray and how he applied that again and eventually with the Brownsville Revival. This is God who again burst in a timeless plan. We see it in revivals in history and of course in today. Listen, Brownsville has not been studied enough and we're not done hearing what Pastor John Kilpatrick has to say about the Pensacola Revival. So keep watching. But for now, that's it. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV.